is Messi. It is the cleanest of clean finishes from the best on the planet. It's time for the biggest sports stories. Liverpool, the champions of Europe, are top of the world. The biggest interviews. That uh, such a great spectacle is ruined by such such thuggish behaviour. And all the analysis. Right here. He's the one player that has the arrogance to think that he can play in any stadium in the world and any pitch in the world in front of any player in the world and take them on. Every weekday, it's my sport, it's your sport. It's CFM Sport. Let's join the team for the biggest show in the world of sport on ZFM Stereo. My station, your station. It's a very good evening, Zimbabwe, and welcome to it. ZFM Sport on a Monday evening after the weekend that was. That feels so good to say that again because for once there was some football action and it was in the Bundesliga. So you don't want to miss out on the beautiful game in the second half of the show. It's going to be lit as we run through the A to Z of German football. My name is Mike Madoda and with me in studio, Chris Gray. Alois Bunjira, Barry Manandi, and our producer is Sean Tafirenika. What can you look forward to elsewhere on the show? On the home front, the Sables face the grim prospect of going through the whole of 2020 without playing any test matches after World Rugby's decision to postpone international games scheduled for the June and July period due to the coronavirus pandemic. International sport Rory McIlroy and Dustin Johnson emerged victorious in golf's return to live televised action at the TaylorMade Driving Relief in Florida. In Around the World in 60 Seconds, we begin in New Zealand where super rugby players today began what coaches have deemed to be a second preseason as they return to training following a relaxation of health and travel restrictions. In Ireland, UFC star McGregor tweeted that a rematch between Mayweather and himself is inevitable and this time there will be a different outcome. And in the United States, the Tennis Association insists their main goal is to stage the 2020 US Open at the home of tennis in New York. And even though they are exploring every possibility, they're not keen on moving the event. And after that, we'll take in our play of the day. Today's Manic Monday, so you look for a up-tempo track on the show today. Then we dive into the beautiful game where the Germans, they who are famed for being efficient, have been efficient once again they are back in terms of football and they lead the beautiful game as Erling Haaland confidently claimed his immediate return to scoring form came as no surprise after helping Borussia Dortmund to a big Bundesliga win over Schalke in the Premier League a senior official says players should not receive their wages if they refuse to return to training in La Liga clubs started group training today as they step up a return to action in June. And in Serie A, the start of a full training at Italy's professional soccer clubs has been postponed from today as they continue to wrangle over the government's medical rules for dealing with the virus. All makes for a very exciting show, but first is our power play. The Warriors, the Chevrons, the Cheetahs, the Mighty Warriors and the Sables. From the pool to the track to the field, we are Team Zimbabwe. The Home Front. Local sports news and analysis. Right, let's get the show on the road with news from the home front where the Sables face a grim prospect of going through the whole of 2020 without playing any test matches after World Rugby's decision to postpone international games scheduled for June and July due to the coronavirus pandemic. Zimbabwe's national rugby side were bracing for a business schedule this year with the Brendan Dawson Coast side initially earmarked to feature in three high-profile competitions between April and August. Zimbabwe is expected to get the season underway by fielding an academy side made up mostly of Sables players in the Supersport Rugby Challenge, which was expected to start last month before the first international test matches of the season in the 2020 Rugby Africa Cup. Now, we caught up with Zimbabwe under-18 rugby coach and ZFM rugby pundit Gordon Pangetti, who shared his insights on the potential impact of the Sables missing game time. Most of the players that we have are based in South Africa, uh, some uh, mostly in England and a few European uh, uh, countries as well. So you'll find that majority of our, of, of, of our players are here in Africa. And um, 
if I'm not mistaken, we almost base how we will structure our game uh, with the South African uh, way of, of, of playing. And at the moment, no one has actually been able to play any rugby in South Africa. Um, therefore, most of the guys are doing uh, in-house training uh, from home and just trying to stay active. Uh, there's a massive cost uh, in getting teams to play against each other and you are all aware that uh, the Z ZRU uh, does not have the funds available. I think we are uh, you know, standing uh, at the cusp of maybe forfeiting matches for this year unless uh, we try and um, schedule games closer to the end of the year. From my end, uh, a grave, grave prospects ahead. It, it, it does look dark and gloomy, but... Um, We've got to stay positive. I don't know if one year of not playing is going to completely uh, take away the blueprint that Dawson had set and uh, the possibility of maybe looking at those players in Zimbabwe and uh, seeing what they can do, maybe get some strength and conditioning programs for them, uh, get them to do some testing, and hopefully uh, come early next year, we can try and propose some, some, some matches uh, in South Africa. Z. That was Gordon Pangetti, the Zimbabwe under-18 rugby coach, speaking to our producer, Sean Tafirinika, earlier. Now, Alois Munjira, you, of course, uh, were a, a professional sports person, and uh, you understand the importance of game time to a professional athlete. How worried are you that uh, the Sables may not have any competitive action uh, for 12 to 18 months? Yeah, oh Mike, it's always a problem. We always say that, you know, if you are a footballer, if you are a rugby player, a basketball player, you know, all these board games, your fitness depends on, on, your, on, your, on, your, on, your, on, on the matches that you play. If Andrew he doesn't have match fitness. He doesn't have match fitness. This is what we're talking about. Match fitness, you can only get match fitness when you play. You can train every day, all in one. But match fitness, you won't get it. It's not just about the physical fitness, your muscles and all that. You know, it involves a lot of things, the mentality, you know, your mind and your 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 cardio, everything else comes into effect. When you play, that's when you combine all aspects of training to, to put into a match. Then you actually match fit. So if you don't play games, you will not get match fitness at all. You can be fit physically, but you won't have the match fitness. When the matches really come, you won't cope. You won't cope at all. You will be coughing. I don't know, the, your chest will be burning within 5-10 minutes. When you get into a match, you may be as fit as you think. But if you don't play 5 minutes into a match, you're already having a perfect. Now, of course, uh, the main competition uh, that the Sables uh, play in is the Rugby Africa Cup. And they were facing encounters uh, against Tunisia away and then Ghana at home. Uh, with victories in those matches, setting up a likely date against continental rivals Namibia in the semi-finals. Zimbabwe also penciled to defend the Victoria Cup title after the four-nation competition, which also featured Kenya, Uganda and Zambia, bounced back last season. Those are the matches that we know for certain, Barry, were on the calendar uh, for the Sables. And uh, so there will be a bit of worry there. Now, the other aspect that's also of concern, Barry, that adds perhaps uh, gravity to the situation is the fact that we don't have any domestic competitions to talk about that will be meaningful uh, for these players in the, in the meantime. Yeah, Mike, and uh, you know what? The, the Sables actually had the benefits of having so such a busy schedule, uh, mitigating against the lack of game time they were getting on the domestic scene, because as you quite rightly point out, we, we have uh, competitions that pop up here and there, intercity and all sorts, but we don't have a consistent league uh, that is running nationally. So that's a real struggle. And to look at it, having the Super Sport Rugby Challenge, the Africa Cup, and then having the Victoria Cup, those were competitions where the Sables were staying sharp the whole time. And to think that they can go potentially... 12 to 18 months without game time and then slip straight into it, that's going to be a real struggle. So um, there, there are tough times ahead for rugby, but I think there's tough, tough times for everybody. So they're going to have to come up with a strategy to mitigate against um, losing the gains that they had over the past few months. I'm not sure what the answer is, but they need to find it. 
Well, one of the uh, competitions that they possibly won't be able to take part in is the Super, Super Sport Rugby Challenge Cup, uh, which of course uh, would have seen Zimbabwe grouped alongside South African provincial sides, Western Province, Border, the Sharks 15, Free State 15, Borland Cavaliers, uh, the Southwest Districts, the Eastern Province Elephants, and uh, that would have been really, really good competition, isn't it, Chris, for our boys? But um, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, even things like travel restrictions will be a challenge for the Sables. Definitely. And I think specifically looking at um, the Supersport Challenge, South Africa's recording, I think they've become the epicenter for the ep- pandemic in Africa at the moment. So the likelihood that they'll be able to open up their borders even before the beginning of next year is not likely at the moment. This competition, however, had done a good job last year of showing us exactly where the Sables were in terms of how competitive they were playing across the continent. We were seeing... Um, I think an improvement throughout the competition. So it's especially sad that the competition that had kind of groomed the Sables and made them a better outfit, they won't be able to participate in it. And this is, I think, the competition that made them sharp enough to then um, manage to grab that Victoria Cup title. Uh, rugby fans, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us on Twitter and Facebook. Follow and interact with at ZFM Sport. Your thoughts on the future of the Sables, but not just the Sables, but also of Zimbabwe rugby. It is a sport that is high on intensity. It is a sport that is high on physical contact. What are the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic going to be on how rugby is played and also how we take it in as fans and then notably at the very top of the triangle at the very top of the pyramid how the Sables go about their business because being a Sable means that you have to play international rugby otherwise that title that tag of Sable will not exist How is it guys? Elvis Bomba Moyo WPF this is the bomb. All Africa Heavyweight Champion two time. Uh, you are listening to ZFM Sport. All right, let's get into our local sports news roundup, uh, starting with the bad news for athletes because Zimbabwean athletes have been dealt a body blow as they will miss out from the 500,000 US dollar bailout fund after the World Athletics said part of the criteria for eligibility is for one to have qualified for the 2020 Olympics due to the postponement of sporting competitions. No Zimbabwean athlete had met the qualifying standard according to Zimbabwe's chef de mission, Tabani Gonye. Two weeks ago, World Athletics and the International Athletics uh, Foundation announced that a welfare fund had been created to support professional athletes who have lost a substantial part of their income due to the suspension of international competitions this year. On to mixed martial arts. Now, South Africa-based Zimbabwean heavyweight boxer Elvis the Wolai Obama Moyo is hopeful that last week's Ultimate Fighting Championship of UFC fights staged in Florida, United States of America, might pave the way for more bouts to take place in empty venues. Moyo, who competes in boxing and the Extreme Fighting Championship Africa, is one of many fighters whose livelihoods have been affected by the global shutdown of sporting activities due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But the Johannesburg-based fighter who goes by the stage name the Bulawayo Bomber believes relaxation of lockdown restrictions will afford him an opportunity to practice in the presence of his trainer and possibly a chance to fight in an empty venue. Let's wrap it up with the Castle Lager Premier Soccer League. The Premier Soccer League is in consultations with the Ministry of Health over plans on how to commence the 2020 season during this coronavirus pandemic. This comes after the Ministry of Sports and Sports and Recreation Commission last week proposed a program that will allow for the resumption of sport gradually depending on the risk of infection associated with the activity. While other sporting codes like cricket, triathlon, badminton, baseball, lawn bowls, softball, weightlifting, gymnastics, goalball and rabble tennis will be allowed to resume their activities. Football, on the other hand, was classified as a high-risk activity. Hi, this is Mike Madod and you can catch me and the team for all the latest breaking news out of the world of sport, local as well as international on your favorite station, my station, your station, ZFM. We are Z Team on ZFM Sport. Z. From the front of the grid to the back of the net, it's ZFM Sport. International Sports News Roundup, where the world comes out to play. 
<laughs> Our international sports news roundup uh, starts with uh, golf news, where a bit of golf is back. Where Rory McIlroy, Dustin Johnson emerged victorious in golf's return to live televised action at the TaylorMade Driving Relief in Florida. Contested over what turned out to be 19 holes at a blustery Seminole Golf Club, McIlroy landed the final 1.1 million in skins with one smooth swish of a wedge in a nearest the pin challenge, which secured victory over Oklahoma State University graduates Ricky Fowler and Matthew Wolf. It was a charity match in which the production and protocols were just as important and noteworthy as the quality of the golf, which was understandably inconsistent from each of the quartet. Rory McIlroy insisted he was feeling the pressure as he stood over the deciding shot. Uh, I didn't know whether to tell it to get up, get down, stay long, stay short. Um, I wouldn't be known for my wedge play, so um, it's feeling a little pressure there. I mean, Matt hit a decent shot in. It's you know, it's only 120 yards, but it's a it's a tough shot. So just to, to see it land on the green and stay there, because these seminal greens, the the ball can do funny things when you, you think it's in a good spot. So um, look, really happy. It was an awesome day playing with DJ, Matt, Ricky, uh, all of us out here for a great cause and. Um, yeah, it's, it's been awesome. It was nice to get back on the golf course and, and get back to some sort of normalcy. Z. Well, golf is back, uh, Chris. It's, it's, it's back in some, some light and sphere. Uh, it was a charity golf match, skins, um, and Rory McIlroy sinking, well, not sinking, but uh, getting nearest the pin on that uh, deciding 19th hole. But just to see golf back, you got to think to yourself that golfers are one of those sports whereby they can get back to speed a lot quicker than other sports because in truth it's less intense and demanding uh, than other physical sports i would think so but i think uh, to a certain extent like alois was saying earlier when it comes to match fitness i think there's also something to be said about the mental fitness that they would have you're working in a covid environment uh, covid19 environment where they also have fears around infection and as much as look golf Definitely, there's a lot more space. They're outdoors, etc., etc. I think there's something to be said about the mental aspect, which was what I think would come into this. And as much as yes, they've managed to um, kind of play this tournament for charity, and they've gone back to playing. It's it, it might be a different setup when they go back to playing competitively. And you're quite right. It was for charity. They raised four million dollars. And just going back to the COVID nineteen the coronavirus mitigation measures, only the match referee, Mike Mark Russell, was permitted to touch the flag stick. So they they tried to institute that uh, social distancing protocol and ensure that people were not interacting at close quarters. Uh, neither were they touching things that another person was touching. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think important just to to make sure that uh, nothing happens. Uh, though I think for golf, though, uh, listen, it's you and I, Barry, can pick up a, a golf badge tomorrow uh, and go and play eighteen. Uh, we might even yeah. be able to play thirty six if time permits. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. in terms of uh, the challenge, physically, I don't think it's uh, it's that much of a problem. Uh, and uh, even uh, listen. It's a sport that thrives on silence as well, you know, yeah, uh, that yeah. is key, you know, unless it's the Ryder Cup, you know, many, many lay fans of golf, you know, they, they, they look at the Ryder Cup uh, because that's the one uh, tournament that a lot of people watch, even those outside golf, and they think that's how golf is played. Golf is not played in that manner. You know, when a player is taking their shot, there's absolute silence. Uh, so they're, they're used to the silence. So uh, if anything, to be honest, uh, golfers tend to play a lot better without an audience. Uh, yes. Golfers tend to perform uh, a lot better. Uh, you know, I, it, it takes me back to even guys like Ernie Els, uh, Nick Price, when they were interviewed about um, their experiences playing with Tiger Woods. They spoke about that factor that, you know what, playing with Tiger Woods is different because you've got thousands of people who are around you and can put you off your game completely. So when golf does return, uh, with or without fans, I don't think it's going to hamper the quality of golf. I think the golfers are just going to play their normal game. If not, some of them are actually going to play even better. Yeah, some of them might play better. They, they, we understand that uh, some of the golfers, the, the the ones closer to the top of the rankings, as as it were, were saying that the fans give them a bit of energy and all sorts. But then I think that's at the really elite level. So I certainly agree with Mike, what Mike is saying. And uh, Chris, just looking at Rory McIlroy himself, Mike says that you can pick up clubs at the honor of being the first 
player to strike a ball in anger and did so with a 320-yard uh, drive straight down the middle of the fairway. So there were no rust issues there. Yes, we saw the inconsistency creep in later on in that match, but certainly it looks like uh, golf might get back uh, back to speed a lot quicker than other sports. Definitely, it might get back to speed um, faster than the other sports, especially because of like what we talked about, the environment in which golf is played. They're outside without the fans this time. It's going to be significantly easier for them. And uh, it's, I think when you look at players like McElroy, you can see definitely that golfers are itching to get back onto the course. Well, this is how it played out because with the final six skins worth $1.1 million unclaimed after holes 13 to 18 were tied, the match headed back to the short 17th, which had been turned into a 120-yard par 3 in readiness for the winner-takes-all nearest the pin shootout. And after Matthew Wolf had set the target at around 15 feet for him and partner Ricky uh, Fowler, but Dustin Johnson missed the green altogether and left McElroy to decide the encounter, which he did in style with a crisp wedge to pin high, 12 feet left of the hole. So uh, that won them the match. That's uh, Justin Johnson, DJ, and Rory McIlroy. The good thing is that this, there was something to watch on the TV this past weekend. Hi, my name's Ryan Kins, Sunshine Tour professional golfer, and you're listening to ZFM Sport. Around the world in 60 seconds. International sports news. We take you around the world in 60, courtesy of DSTV. We take off in New Zealand where Super Rugby players today began what coaches have deemed to be a second preseason as they return to training following a relaxation of health and travel restrictions. Southern Hemisphere Rugby's governing body, Sanzar, postponed the rugby season in March just after seven weeks of the competition as governments responded to the spreading coronavirus pandemic with border closures and travel shutdowns. New Zealand Rugby, facing a multi-million dollar loss this year due to the pandemic, announced earlier this week a new domestic competition involving its five Super Rugby teams would start on the 13th of June. Players are expected to ease into training to allow their bodies to get used to the high-impact collisions. We get over to Ireland where after receiving some praise from former world champion Mike Tyson for his boxing skills, UFC star Conor McGregor tweeted that a rematch with Mayweather is inevitable and this time there will be a different outcome. The first fight in 2017 was the most anticipated and high-profile boxing debut of all time as McGregor swapped the octagon for a ring to take on pound-for-pound great Mayweather. McGregor lost by a 10th round stoppage in Las Vegas in what was one of the richest bouts in boxing history. We touched down in the United States where the United States Tennis Association insists their main goal is to stage the 2020 US Open at the home of tennis in New York and even though they are exploring every possibility, they are not keen on moving the event. This year's US Open is scheduled to take place from the 31st of August until the 13th of September at Flushing Meadows. But the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic has left left a lot of question marks over the tournament. New York is currently the epicenter of the outbreak in the US, while the Billie Jean King National Tennis Center has also been used as a makeshift hospital to treat patients. La Liga and Supersport have started the countdown to return of action of the Spanish League by launching a special series called Hashtag Back to Win, episodes of which will be shown every Friday on Supersport 13. Hi, I'm Varios Coach Zdravko Logarusic and you are listening to ZFM Sport. Sports with a difference. Z. The big leagues, the big teams, the big players. The beautiful game on ZFM Sport. Horsepower unmatched. Talk to beat the best. Speed unrivaled. Sleek and easy on the eye. Let's get behind the wheel of football engineered to perfection. The Bundesliga made in Germany. 
So proud to have a look back at action over the weekend because football is back and it is out of possibly the populace in the world that is famed for being most efficient and they've efficiently returned to Bundesliga action in Germany. And Erling Haaland confidently claimed his immediate return to scoring form came as no surprise after helping Borussia Dortmund to a big Bundesliga win over Schalke. The 19-year-old Norwegian struck the opener in his side's 4-0 victory at the Westfalen Stadium on Saturday as Germany's top tier resumed following a two-month suspension due to the coronavirus pandemic. Rafael Guerrero added a brace either side of an emphatic Thorgan Hazard finish to complete the Riviera Derby route for host Dortmund who showed few signs of rust. Four and a half hours away in Saxony, RB Leipzig's uh, Bundesliga title hopes suffered a blow as visitors Freiburg held them to a one-all draw. Haaland suggested his 10th goal in nine Bundesliga appearances was to be expected in a monosyllabic-like post-match interview. After the final whistle, you and the whole teammates, you were going to the south stand, the famous yellow wall, which was empty today, of course. Uh, why did you do that? Uh, why not? Is it a kind of message you want to send out? Yes. Would you tell us a message? To my fans. To yeah, my fans. They're everything for you and for Borussia Dortmund. It is. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure to talk to you. See. Mike and I, I know you're happy to have action back. Uh, so what what we can say, though, is that we didn't expect the height of and quality of performance, the level and nature we saw from Borussia Dortmund. They looked like a well-oiled machine. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think apart from a 10 to 15 minute period, uh, at the start of the game where Schalke looked like they were actually at the races. Uh, they they created the first couple of openings, Schalke. Uh, they were better on the ball initially. Uh, and I think it was to be expected because uh, these are guys uh, who haven't kicked a football in anger in six to eight weeks. Uh, so there was always going to be that rustiness. There was always going to be that lack of match fitness. But uh, Dortmund were quick to hit their stride. And I think that's testament to the fact that they, they have the better players. Uh, you know, and uh, the fact that they could leave Sancho on the bench. They didn't yeah. have their captain, uh, Marco Royce, as well in, in the team. Uh, Emre Chan was not in the side. It also speaks volumes about their depth and the, the, the side that has been assembled or that is in the process of being assembled uh, in, in Dortmund. So, uh, quality performance from Borussia Dortmund. You know, Julian Brandt, I thought, was the unsung hero in midfield. Deft touches. Uh, you know, and uh, sometimes we, we, we pay too much homage to the guys who score the goals and to the guys who give the assists. Uh, and yet we forget the guys that actually control the tempo of the game. Uh, and Julian Brandt, I thought, was outstanding. Thorgan Hazard as well. He's beginning to build a, a reputation for himself. We all know uh, uh, the, the older Hazard, Eden Hazard at Real Madrid, the former Chelsea player. But his younger boot looks like he's got a bit about him. Uh, and that uh, delivery that he sent in for Ireland's uh, first goal. Uh, listen, he put it on a silver platter for him and he finished. So, great performance uh, by Borussia Dortmund. The stats didn't favour them in the build-up to this match. Remember, we did the build-up. Uh, we talked about uh, Schalke having dominated this fixture in the last 10 or so games. Uh, but Borussia Dortmund showing that they have goals in them now. Uh, and uh, they will be able to stay in this race until the very end. And, and those goals that Mike is talking about, Alois, are mainly coming from Erling Haaland. I mean, fantastic signing. 19-year-old who's building a strong reputation for himself. And, uh, you know, due credit to him, he opened the scoring. And with a, a finish that you're a striker, it, it, he made it look easy, but it wasn't an easy finish altogether. And uh, that's the sort of thing that Borussia Dortmund was missing in the first half of the season. And now they've got those goals, a 4-0 route. Thanks. Now on to the next one. Yeah, you know, uh, we, 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 we say it all the time that, you know, when you practice, you need to keep on practicing. And then when you do that, you have what you call muscle memory. It, it looks easy, you know, when you watch it. It's because you practice those things. It doesn't just come on that day. It actually shows that this boy trains. He knows what he's doing. During lockdown, I'm telling you now, he must have been training like really hard. Probably he actually trained much better than when the games were still on because he had a lot of time for himself where he could actually master his technique. He did a lot of individual training. So he can actually be more dangerous than he was before because he put so much 
in his training as an individual. It becomes so easy when you see him doing it. The body just follows what he's already, you know, it's insane. The body and the mind, they are now in sync. He knows when the body is coming this way, my body reacts this way, it works that way. You know, he is going to be a one hell of a player. And watch out for this boy. He's only 19. And you can actually see that with the professionalism that he has got. And he is a, a, a modest, you know, I'm, I, it's, they're not the giants of Europe. Let's, Let's be honest, you know, Borussia Dortmund, yes, they, they are here and there, they go up and down as European giants, but he started at a very good club. There's not much pressure, unlike when he was at Bayern, if he was at Bayern Munich. Borussia Dortmund, he is going to grow. I'm afraid that, you know, already the teams are already after him. Real Madrid, they want him. Manchester United, they want him. But I'd rather he stays maybe one more season at Borussia Dortmund, then he will be a really finished product. And what a player we are going to have in that boy. You know, he has got everything that you need. Everything. And you can see the professionalism, the way he scores those goals. He's one player who can actually train and he trains on his own. And you see his body so fluent. He's a, he's a, he's a consummate striker. But, I mean, uh, Dortmund wasn't playing alone, were they, Chris? They were playing against a Schalke side that we gave uh, a bit more credit um, in the build-up to this match but unfortunately when they ran out onto the green grass they, they're the ones who actually looked leggy uh, they looked like they were struggling certainly in the second half I mean uh, Dortmund had the freedom of the city of the actual uh, entire football field so I think yes there are some teams that are going to click back into gear like a Dortmund uh, but there are teams that might struggle uh, to get back into their groove just like Schalke Definitely. Um, they've had a winless run. I think it's eight games now since the 12th of January. So I think this was just an extension of that, clearly. But also, I think there's certain areas that Schalke needs to look at. For me, their defense, um, somewhat shocking, especially their goalkeeper. Um, and those are things that they may need to look into if they are to even... Um, look, they've dropped down now... Um, in terms of their position. But I think that's something they would need to look into just to finish the rest of the season. Well, their defense was, for me, a, a little bit shocking. A quick look at uh, Red Bull Leipzig, Mikey. Um, they, they drop points. That's if in this crunch time with eight games to go, you don't want to be doing that if you want to uh, compete for the title. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's safe to say we can, we can rule them out of the running uh, for the Bundesliga title. Uh, I think uh, they won't yeah. be, be able to challenge. Uh, I think the, the gap that's been created now uh, between themselves and Bayern Munich, uh, I think that's too much uh, for Red Bull Leipzig to try and claw back. I think they're going to try and put all their eggs in one basket, which is in the um, UEFA Champions League. Uh, we saw how Red Bull Leipzig dismantled Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, for me, they have the look of Ajax Amsterdam. Uh, same style, same level of intensity, uh, and uh, they look like they could go all the way. If the bigger teams left in the competition don't give them respect, especially in the shortened format of the Champions League, as we anticipate it will come back in in August, uh, this team could well shock a lot of people in the competition. So I think they've given up on the Bundesliga title, uh, and they will certainly be uh, going for uh, the UEFA Champions League. So Red Bull Leipzig certainly ruled out of... Uh now, this is a championship race, but let's go back to Borussia Dortmund. I just remembered the post-match interview of Erling Haaland. He's pheno a phenomenal striker, but you've got to say, Chris, he, he's a nightmare for reporters with his one-word answers. Absolutely. And um, yesterday, you could see all over social media, they started actually pulling up previous interviews where he literally says at most maybe four words. And it's I'm not sure it's it's... A problem? I think it's quite entertaining to be honest because he really gives the reporters a run for their money and he's created oh, a different it's personality. Poor. It's poor. What? Wow. Absolutely poor. Uh, I, th I think the uh, part of the responsibility that you get as a footballer is that you've got to contribute to the narrative of, of, of the game. Uh, I think the media plays a part in, 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 in trying to get to build your brand. Uh, you have a wonderful opportunity to showcase yourself you, I'm, I'm taking a look at Nike Adidas I'm taking a look at the big brands when they're looking at uh, at Haaland giving an interview like that you're not selling yourself you're not doing yourself any favors I disagree though the reason we're even having this conversation is because of that monosyllabic response that he gives we're having a discussion I, 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 
Chris, we, dis- we, we, we are on this on this conversation now because it is it, really poor. We're discussing, you know, they, you know, sometimes they say there's no, there's not no one that is not uh, entirely useless. Some are good for this bad examples. He is actually a bad example of, uh, of, of of a player that is trying to to sell himself. Like Mike said, the narrative of the game as well. You need to, to have a striker that can actually give you a perspective of a game they say he scored how did he score that goal you know I, I saw the defender running that way i knew i could beat him to that to that ball so i diverted my head you need to take the fans back into how you did it and so that they can actually have that pick you need to you need to to, to, to bring them back in and that way as well you are actually telling people that you know that you are fluent you can actually contribute towards the whole framework of the game altogether now just giving you know don't act like Rune as well. Like everybody, you just wanna, you just wanna go. Interviews are actually part of the game, and professional players are actually taught how to, uh, how to respond to questions from, from journalists. You actually, it's actually like you are groomed to do it's that. Not thing. So from that, if you are the, the, the modern day player has an obligation to the media. That is why Ferguson was being was being fined every season for refusing to talk to the BBC. You're getting TV rights money. That TV rights money is not for you to come and show off your arrogant personality. It's for you yeah. to come and answer questions from the media about how you are playing the game. Simple. Exactly. It's so that simple. Fans to, try, to try and bridge, to try and bridge for entertainment value, it's great. But for functionality, yeah, entertainment and social media, what, yes, yes. His, his obligation as a professional football he, footballer, he certainly needs to improve his media skills. Does Erling Haaland? Let's take a look at Bayern Munich next. Yeah, Bayern Munich was certainly in action uh, yesterday afternoon and of course or yesterday evening here in Zimbabwe and uh, we can tell you that Robert Lewandowski or Robert Lewagolski, he is being back to challenge Gerd Muller's record of scoring 40 goals in a single Bundesliga season. The powerful Pole took his season's tally to 26 goals in 24 league games with a penalty that set Bayern on course for a 2-0 win at Union Berlin or Union Berlin last night. In their first game back after the coronavirus suspension, Bayern were the dominant side without being at their very best. Now, former Scotland international and football pundit Craig Burley says Robert Lewandowski is one of the best strikers on the planet. Yeah, and if Germany are able to finish the season, and there's no suggestion that they can't from what seems at the moment like a successful weekend, then you know, we could be looking at, at, at 50. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's quite incredible. He is, you know, a, he, he's the best striker on the planet. If we're just talking about an out and out number nine, he is the best front man, natural front man on the planet at the moment. And that's a hell of a commodity to have. He, he had a, a quietish game, but you can just tell there was one time in the second half when a, a Jerome Bolton ball went straight up to him and he tried a little flick over the top. Uh, one touch to almost one two for himself and it almost came off and you can just tell this guy he's he's got the quality he's got the confidence he's fit again after the break which was a bit of a bonus for him and he's not going to stop going, uh, scoring goals soon this guy is not going away in the next uh, 18 to 24 months Z. Robert Lewandowski on the score sheet. Uh, ultimately comfortable victory, Alois, uh, for uh, Bayern Munich 2-0 uh, over Union Berlin. Uh, he is called one of the best strikers on the planet, but there are many who are calling him the best central striker right now in Europe. I am one of those, Mike, that are calling him the best uh, striker. I've said it. I wanted him at Bayern Munich. I wanted him to go to... Uh, to England. I just wanted him to be at the very, very biggest stage. Yes, guys, you actually heard that Bayern Munich is actually one of the best clubs in Europe. But I still think that he could have actually gone to do one better if he had gone to a team like uh, Manchester City, Manchester United, or even now Real Madrid. I would have loved to see him at Real Madrid at the very best, you know. And I, I, I think that he could actually have, uh, his brand could actually have Gone and compete, not not really necessarily at the same level as Cristiano Ronaldo at Real Madrid, but he could have gone there. He could have gone there and did himself a very big favor because I know that he is a very very good striker, and I actually believe those. 
I agree with everybody who is saying that he is the best striker in the world. I've watched him play. He is not just a box player. He does a lot of things with the ball. He is tall, he's big, he's skillful, he's fast. He can score any kind of goal. You know, for me, I think he's actually one of the best strikers I've actually ever watched playing football. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that, uh, Alois, that Lewandowski, is, he's, he's got that innate ability to be a box player, but also be able, outside of the box, to bring others into play as well. So you look at uh, the attributes of a striker. Is he able to hold up play? Lewandowski ticks that box. Is he able to, to lay off and then spin behind? He can certainly do that. What are his runs like, his movement? Does he have channel, channel, channel options for his, his, um, his teammates? Uh, what does he do when he gets the ball in the box and he's ticking every single box? Every so for box me, and best, yes. Okay. And, and I think he also benefits from the fact that he's, he's got a very good number 10 playing next to him uh, I, in Thomas Muller. Thomas Muller is absolutely fantastic. He creates yeah, a lot of space for Robert Lewandowski, his movement, his passing. He really brings them into the game. And uh, what I like about Thomas Muller is that Thomas Muller is not necessarily greedy for a goal. So he's not competing with Robert Lewandowski in terms of yes. putting them into the back of the net. He's willing to play the role of a facilitator. Uh, and so they are. he's a perfect foil, a perfect complement for Robert Lewandowski. Now, Chris, having watched that game by Munich in action yesterday, comfortable victory, 2-0. Uh, we're going to give the Bundesliga log standings a bit later on, but they're, they're, they're sitting comfortably four points ahead uh, of uh, Borussia Dortmund in second. Did you see any chinks in the armor, any sort of weakness that can be exploited? in the remaining matches or you think that Bayern Munich may well be a shoe-in for the title? I think Bayern may well be a shoe-in for the title at this point. Um, and it, it, it's it's going to come down to, look, in fact, it's already come down to these final games, but that four-point gap for me, I think, is enough for them to be able to hold on until the end of the season. And in as much as yesterday, look, all the teams that have been playing this weekend have had a bit of rust and we can give them that. But they managed to really hold their own in this match and they were distinctly different, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, I think it'll all come down to that big game uh, that will be played, I think, on the weekend of the 26th uh, when uh, Borussia Dortmund take on Bayern Munich. If Dortmund lose that game, uh, they'll fall seven points behind the log leaders. But if they win that game, they could make it very, very, very interesting in the race for honours. Just taking a look at that, the Bundesliga standings, uh, the latest ones, Bayern Munich leading the way, 58 points. Dortmund in second, 54. Borussia Mönchengladbach are in third place on 52 points. What a season they are having. And uh, RB Leipzig are now in fourth. They have 51 points, seven points behind Bayern Munich. And it's very difficult to see them claw back or claw their way back into the title race. Uh, Leverkusen is in fifth. Wolfsburg is in sixth. At the bottom, the relegation strugglers are Paderborn. Werder Bremen, one of the biggest teams in German Germany, and they are in 17th. And then Fortuna Düsseldorf is in 16th place. Only one home win in eight matches uh, this weekend is something that I think we perhaps just referred to uh, very briefly, Alois, in that uh, listen, the, the, the intensity of the players, obviously, they're not back up to speed. There are no fans and issues like that. So it looks like uh, home advantage is no advantage in an empty stadium. <laughs> yeah, you know, sometimes, you know, as a footballer, you want to play where the fans is different from golf. Like you said, you know, a golfer can actually play better when there are no fans. But I don't know of many players that play better when there are no fans. You know, players actually thrive on fans. And now, when you're playing in an empty or travel or you're playing it in an empty man seat it becomes a matter of that playing area you know you don't have to worry about so all the playing areas are all the same i don't see any anything that is going to be away or because you know you know there's the, the pitches in europe there's no one that will say but i'm going to talk about my opening agenda no make page change all these pitches are well designed they are, they are in good perfect condition so, so it becomes a situation whereby it's all about just playing football, no home advantage at all. It's going to be interesting to actually see what happens until the end of the season because, like I said, there's no no one who is going to say, no, we'll be at home, we'll beat you like this because there are not going to be any fans. Fans play a big role. When teams say we are playing at home, it's more to do with fans, nothing else. Not because they, when it comes to the pitch, to the objective, it's, it's the same. It all comes down to the fans. 
So, so, so really, to be honest, uh, you know, teams like uh, Bulawayo Chiefs in Zimbabwe and uh, teams of that nature, uh, they really wouldn't be able to claim any home advantage of any nature, is it, with your 26 fans? Uh, but um, <laughs> just going back, Barry, to the <laughs> to the issue of 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 fans in stadiums, and um, is it a surprise then that Borussia Dortmund, for example, blew Schalke fear off the park? and Bayern Munich was comfortable in their victory because without fans, without external factors, then really it comes down to the technical ability of the players and the tactical yes. setup of the team. It does, it does. And that, that's exactly it. And I've been agreeing with Alex and you and, and, and Chris uh, vociferously on the basis that those clubs in England that were saying that, oh, we don't want to play in neutral venues, uh, we're, we're talking nonsense. Uh, one win in eight matches, one home win in eight matches. That just shows you that there's a, it's a neutral venue. Even if you're you're playing at home, there's no advantage because the pitch is flat. Uh, you wait for demands it, and you have to deliver it. So you, all it is yeah. is playing surface. There's no home advantage. They should have just carried on, and not delayed the project restart in the UK. Now they can see from Germany. Yeah, and uh, Chris, just going on uh, to to the empty stadiums, it it wasn't ideal, uh, you know, for the purist. uh, We've talked about how these players feed off the energy of the fans, the songs, the cheers, you know, the atmosphere in the stadium. So uh, as far as a spectacle, it it, it wasn't ideal for us watching on on TV. But uh, I think people are just happy to have football back. Definitely. Um, I think... We all got into it eventually. Initially, it was a little bit weird that something would happen and there's no cheering from the fans. There's, it just sounded a little bit strange. But towards, I think, the end of even just the first game anyone watched, you got used to the fact that there are no fans in the stadium. The players won't be feeding off of that energy. And um, it's just great to have, first of all, something to talk about on the show that's not coronavirus directly related, <laughs> but nah. also just to have some entertainment across the weekend. I'm not going to let you get away without mentioning the coronavirus because even as the game came back, Chris, I mean, um, we saw some of the the health protocols that were in place. You know, Mm. they they weren't able to celebrate uh, together. There was no hugs, you know, uh, and and issue no kissing if you're Gary Neville and, uh, uh, and, and the likes. Uh, but uh, and then the substitute seat uh, there was uh, exercise in social distancing so there were a few odd ones because at the end of the day these are players that have been tested isn't it so everyone in that stadium should be okay so you should be able to carry on in terms of how you behave and act in a, in the normal way I don't think so. I think they're going to need to continue with some of these protocols, not necessarily because they've been tested already. But look, these players are not going back to one central place where they live. They're going back to different No, no they are, Chris. Well. They, they, they oh. are being isolated. Yeah, they, they are staying in isolated um, training camps. So they're not going back home. That's why I'm saying for me, it was a bit strange because if, if you're training together, Surely you should be able to, to high five and do whatever you want because you are being tested and you're, you've been given the all clear. And then it like may come down to an issue of optics. You've got, you've got a further issue in that in the game, you're grappling, you're pulling, you're doing all sorts to, to, to your opponent, and then you're allowed to celebrate and jump on top of each other when you, when you score a goal. It doesn't make any sense to me. In truth, they're, they're, yep. they're fine. Yep. If you let them play, let them play normally, let them celebrate normally. Yeah, I agree, I agree with you, Bear. percent Look, you're already tackling, you're falling all over each other, by my corner, by by and everything, and then you do, you can high five your teammate. I, mean, I, I don't understand some of these protocols. To be honest, girl. I think as uh, this is a push for one of us, other people with a, with an agenda. Yes, we know, but it's just a border just says, "Oh, my my and Dina and Dina." What's the problem? I'm staying in a camp, and then before I match, everybody gets trusted. So some of these things, they're just taking out the gloss from, from, from the game and you may be trying to highlight this social distancing thing. But Tambuire in the first place is going to do And the social distancing is going to be because I don't know the next person if he has got it or not. So if I already know that he doesn't have it, so why am I doing it? I'm not so sure, but it's okay. We're going to follow, they're, they're going to follow the protocol, but I'm, I'm not for it. If we test, we test. Let's, let's, let's I say this, let's, Take this head on, guys. We, we are there. It's a physical ground. 
Sateswa teze ngati ngati ngo tamba ika burashi Tambu magana haba maundu la miza haifa ezi Bani tapinga nita haka nane mundu na amma haka pakona I don't know man you know <laughs> absolutely and I, and i think it's just like uh, chris highlighted i think uh, some of it is for the optics you know they they are trying to uh, give a certain impression or push a certain uh, yes, impression or, exactly. or push a certain message so it may well be for the optics all the rivalry here is harry kane for Tottenham. the stars talk about impudence talk about improvisation talk about Sadio Mane and all the game changing moments and Raheem Sterling rattles at home and once more City are in front in a choice all the updates from the Premier League on ZFM Sport Some quick updates for you from the rest of Europe. We start off with the Premier League where a senior official at a Premier League club says players should not receive their wages if they refuse to return to training. The 20 clubs are set to agree at their shareholders meeting that players can start training in small groups in strictly controlled conditions. But one club official said players are concerned and do not want to train, then clubs should not pay their wages. In the league, a club started group training today as they step up a return to action in June. Players had to have coronavirus tests before recently resuming individual training with five players testing positive in Spain's top two divisions. The next phase would be a return to full training before a possible La Liga restart behind closed doors on the 12th of June. In Serie A, the start of full training at Italy's professional soccer clubs has been postponed from today as they continue to wrangle over the government's medical rules for dealing with the coronavirus. The Gazzetta dello Sport states broadcaster Rai and other media all said that the government's technical scientific committee had not ratified the rules which were announced in the last week. Several clubs had already decided either to continue with individual training or at most divide players into small groups which would respect social distancing measures. And that report out of Italy bring us to the end of the show. We'll catch you tomorrow, same time as always at ZFM Sport. May God richly bless you. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Manande, out. And it's Messi. It is the cleanest of clean finishes from the best on the planet. The biggest sports stories. Liverpool, the champions of Europe, are top of the world. The biggest interviews. That uh, such a great spectacle is ruined by such such thuggish behavior. And all the analysis right here. He's the one player that has the arrogance to think that he can play in any stadium in the world and any pitch in the world in front of any player in the world and take them on. Every weekday, it's my sport, it's your sport. It's ZFM Sport on ZFM Stereo. My station, your station.